of the Mandalay of Sensei, and you are listening to the Oracle Hour here on Kirsten Radio, and I am here with my very special guest, Edgar Fabian Freya, who is an artist, and a shaman, and a magician, and an all-around awesome person. So, okay, thank you so much for showing up and coming on to the show. Yeah, thank you so much for having me here. I'm, I'm so grateful to be in your presence. Uh, we've known each other for a while. Where did we meet? Did you? I, I saw you for the first time at Human Resources when you performed that incredible banishing. Yeah, and we just were like. Yeah, I, like, honestly, when I saw it, I thought to myself, I'm in the right place. Like, you were just moving down from the district in the Bay Area, right? And so we were like, this is the kind of work that needs to be being made. Like, yeah. this is like, you want to be in a city that's not a, like, a ma- magical renaissance. Yeah, someone who's bringing together all these incredible realms of spiritual practice, creative practice, and anti capitalist work. It was. It was honestly, I think, the second week I had been here, and it really confirmed for me that I was in the right place. And just having worked here now for a bit, I continue to feel that way. I don't know how many beautiful practitioners we have here in this city. I know, I'm really lucky. Well, so why don't you tell us a little bit about your practice, and maybe you can tell us what you're doing in the Bay Area and what you're doing now, like how your practice has evolved since then, and maybe what your background is. Right, okay. So I, um, I moved here a little, um, almost two years ago, I would say, and um, before then, when I was in the Bay, I was working as a social worker. I was working with people with developmental disabilities, and I, at the time, actually wasn't really creating very much. And I had a day where, when I was at my job, and you know, um, before moving to the Bay, I had I helped start like a really radical queer and trans music and arts festival in Portland. I helped start a Latino art group in Portland, and so I've always had a couple of feet, you know, in the creative realm and then the spiritual realm. And when I was working in San Francisco, I like had a moment like where I thought to myself, like I'm not really doing what I need to be doing, and. I left my work that day a little bit on my mind. I asked the divine to give me some sort of signal or message. And as you would imagine, as I walked, I happened to find a red cloth on the floor with a bundle of sage on top of it. And that was a clear signal of, okay, you need to shift some things in your life and really bring back in the spiritual and the creative. Wow. So, okay, so you were there in San Francisco, and you were really working in service in the in the, in the so, sort of supportive way as a social worker, and then you decided to shift gears. And so, did you have a background as an artist, or how did your artistic practice evolve? Like, did you... Because you were saying that you weren't working creatively, but then you, but it seems like that's something that you're just, it's very natural to you. Really? Well, well, I do have a background as an artist. Um, I got my undergraduate at UC Riverside in both art and psychology. So I was able to work with a lot of really incredible, like, Southern California based artists. And, um, I took a break for a while. Um, well, I was in Portland um, in around 2008, and I continued to do art. Um, like I said, I helped to create like a music and arts festival called the Modern Math Crew and Trans Music and Arts Festival. I helped start a Latino art group, and I also exhibited a lot in that city. And during that time, I decided to become a therapist. Mm-hmm. I started my master's in counseling, and so that kind of shifted my gears slightly to doing a lot more therapeutic work. And that's what, um, when I moved to the Bay, that's how I ended up becoming a social worker. But I know that since that time, like, you've been collecting your hours, right, for, yes. to get your MFT license. But then you kind of decided, I know about this personally, that, that maybe you're going to sort of leave it there and instead push your artistic practice and your shamanic practice. Is that right? 
Okay. Right, so I'm, I, I'm very close. I'm like probably 100 hours away from getting my license, which is like super close. Like I'm definitely going to get it by the end of this year. Okay. Congrats. I know that's so much work. It's so much work. Yeah. I've been working on it since 2013. It's so much free work for other people, right? That 3,000 hours is seems a little unfair. Yeah. yeah. And, and, um, and what's interesting is that so when I graduated from, from school in Portland, I had a private practice that I was working with. And they really, the, the program I was with, and I worked with this really incredible internship, a somatic therapeutic internship, they wanted me to continue to work with clients. But at that time, I said no, and I moved. And similarly, now that I'm going to get my license, um, I'm kind of having a moment where I'm like, I want to really delve deep into my creative practice and my spiritual practice. And so I'm not leaving therapy. And at the same time, I think I might take a break. And it's your creative practice is really rewarding you for the work that you're putting in, right? Like, what are, what's going on for you right now with that? You know, I've just been really blessed here in Los Angeles to meet a lot of people who've been really supportive of my practice. I'm one of those people being Marta Bell Wasserman. I love her so much. She's so incredible. She's so magical. She's transformed the Angels Gate Cultural Center, I feel, with the amazing people she's been able to get to do work down there. She has such a powerful vision for creative practice, and she's been, you know, an incredible support of my work, and has asked me to do multiple projects with her. And so um, I've been honored to be included in the um, exhibition that we're going to be doing for Pacific Standard Time. It's called Coastal Border. Um, and essentially, it's social practice, performance-based work that's um, being done by um, myself and a few other artists. And um, my project is called Give Us Home Spider. Yeah, I have a little bit of text about that written by Marta Bell, so I'm going to read that. Yeah. Okay? So, Give Us Home Spider is a series of ritual performances reenacting the Wixarica, is that how you say it? Yeah, Wixarica. Wixarica, sacred journey to Wixarica. Yes. Yeah. Superimposed on top of channels that distribute goods which arrive in the port of Los Angeles and move through predominantly Latino communities of Los Angeles, the Inland Empire, and the Coachella Valley. The documentation of performative rituals will be interspersed with interviews from local community activists and installed in immersive installations, interweaving the artist's research into his Rica Rica heritage with the elements of his contemporary performance practice. So it sounds like it's a series of five rituals. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about the rituals and what goes into making them and what your purpose is in doing those works? Yes. Um, so the first ritual that we did was in San Pedro, and all of the rituals are connected to San Pedro um, specifically because of the Port of Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. The Port of Los Angeles is heavily militarized, very controlled. Um, it's also a very beautiful landscape, and the land there has been colonized, and it's essentially where most of the imports come from all over the planet into the United States. Oh, really? They all come through that port? Yeah, not all of them, but a lot of them. Oh, that's intense. Yeah, and so they move through there, and they move through multiple channels, and um, specifically, they move into like the Inland Empire, and I'm from the Inland Empire. And in, in the Inland Empire, they have been building more and more warehouses. And these warehouses are called the quote unquote dry dock, mm-hmm. is where all the shipments that come into the port of Los Angeles get sorted and then move out to the rest of the country. And so, my, my rituals are tracing this. And I'm, in a sense, um, honoring the legacy and the current work of the Widarika who have these sacred journeys yearly. And so I'm creating that journey, in a sense, by following the flow of capital, in, in a way. And so I'm kind of, like, working with that energy while imbuing it with the Widarika energy. Well, so tell me about the Widarika. Like, who are they? What's their... What's... Because like, uh, I know about the Tongva, the right. Gabrielinos. Are they the indigenous people who are here in the Indian Empire before? No, they're actually from Mexico. Okay. Um, and so part of this, what's connected to this work, is that I've um, 
very recently been exposed to my own indigenous heritage. My, my parents never really spoke about it growing up. Wow. And um, it was actually through a uh, crystal <laughs> that gave me some information. And I you know, ended up ha- asking me to talk to my father, and I talked to him about the information I received. And that was what made him say, well, your grandfather used to do that. He used to talk with crystals. And he said, well, it's part of our, our kind of cultural belief system, but we stopped doing that when we moved into the city. Wow, 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 wow. Let's back out right. here. <laughs> so, okay, so I know that you work a lot with obsidian. Is that the crystal that you're talking about in this case? No. It was another crystal. I believe it's um, like an orange quartz that I like found. Like a tangerine quartz. Like a tangerine quartz um, that I found in the Drupa Valley, which is really close to my parents' house. Wow. So in the inland empire, you found this crystal. And when you say that you were working with this crystal, you received messages from the crystal, tell it, break that process down a little bit. Because I think a lot of people who aren't used to doing magical practices are like, how do you get information from a crystal? Right. Well, it was very spontaneous. Um, I, my partner and I decided for a while that we were going to look for crystals. Um, and, it was, and it came from myself having a dream about, about a crystal being in the mountain nearby. And we ended up finding lots of crystals came to us. And this was one of the crystals that I was cleaning in my parents' backyard. And as I was cleaning it, it sent me... It sent me visuals. I got visuals of like structures and like cyclical energy of time. I was very confused by it because I'd gotten that type of information from animals, from plants, and from people, but never from a crystal. And so that was what, you know, also made me want to talk with my father about it, which is what kind of led to this discovery. Wow, magical. So you yeah. got all these downloads from this crystal, like a friendly little crystal that was like, I've got something, I've got to break some stuff down for you. Yeah. I'm going to show you some stuff. And so that prompted you to talk to your dad. Well, so what kind of relationship have you got with your dad? And does your dad, so your, your father decided when he moved here from where? So my father's from Zacatecas. Okay. And he moved here when he was around 13. And his father, um, it was his father who stopped practicing when he moved into Wanusco, which is a, a small town um, in Zacatecas. And um, I have a pretty good relationship with my father. My father moved here to the United States when he was around 13 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, mostly to help his family. Mm-hmm. They were um, very poor at the time. Did he move here by himself? He moved here by himself, yeah. So he had family? He had family, yeah. He had family in Los Angeles, mm-hmm. and it, which is why he moved to this area at mm-hmm. first. And... Um, well, both my grandfather and my father have kind of almost disowned the indigenous part of themselves. So, is, so how far do, in the distant past is the indigenous lineage, you know, blood, or does it come from just the city that they came from? Or, like, in what way do you, in what way does that indigenous um, aspect influence your, your lineage. Right. Well, so both my parents, my, 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 both my parents are indigenous and they're also mestizos, right? So they both, they have both lineages. Yeah. My grandfather um, is Rigarita, mm-hmm. you know, but he kind of disowned the, I would say, more, the more spiritual, ritualistic, ceremonial parts of himself in order to um, kind of blend more into the mestizo Catholic no, to assimilate. To assimilate. So the Rigarita, do they, are, are they Aztec or Mayan, or is it a whole separate thing? It's a whole separate community. They do they have a separate language? They do have a separate language, and they also they live in Zacatecas, in Oaxaca, and Jalisco. Hmm. And so they live in that area, and they're the only group in Mexico that was never colonized Amazing. by the Span- Spanish. And at the same time, they were, right? Because the, their lineages were also disrupted, okay. and, but they were never completely colonized. So they continue to practice the rituals wow. and ceremonies to this day. So do you ever go back and visit them, or what? that? I mean, I know that that must be such a complicated idea. I want to. I, I've actually been speaking with a couple of Widarita shamans who live here in, in L.A., and I've been wanting to go connect, but I am definitely very just dislocated from that community. Mm. And growing up here in the United States, having my parents kind of disown or separate themselves from that as well. And so... Um, a big part of this project is me also exploring what is my connection to Widarita, the Widarita community and those parts that are within myself. And something that's really 
the other thing that my father told me after I told him the vision I had with the crystal was that the Rebecca believe that crystals have spirits that call you to them. And that they call you because they have a message or you have a certain purpose. And they feel that a lot. And I think that's been a big kind of at the crux of a lot of my creative practices. A long time ago, um, I was sitting about in England and I was given an entire year to work on one art piece. So I was really like, coming from the UC system where you're really regimented and you're given, you know, every week you have projects or reading. And to just be given an open reading night, I didn't really know what to do, but one day I woke up in the middle of the night and I heard the word shamanism and it just like entered into my consciousness and I couldn't get it out. I quickly realized that as much as I felt like I was part of that lineage, I realized that I, w- I was living a system of capitalism. I don't really acknowledge that, doesn't even see it. I don't um, see it, I treat it either as something that can be commodified and exploited, as everything uh, that enters into the proximity of capitalism is sort of corrupted by its gaze in a way, like just by its proximity, but it's also not completely corrupted, but it sort of becomes a part of it. City, like it's world, it, right. it, it becomes an Caesar to, yes. to, to capitalism. Like we can't really be in proximity to capitalism without being informed by it, without having it motivate us in a way. Right. And then, or it is completely dismissive, it treats it as some sort of, it's like, I'm really interested in this idea of like non rationality. Right. And the idea that under capitalism or under the sort of Western lens of, uh, you know, the post-enlightenment, like empirical ways of thought, somehow it's come down that people, like Shimano people, indigenous people, people who really connect profoundly to spirit are somehow irrational, embarrassing, not serious people. Right. And then it's perfectly rational to exploit the earth. It's perfectly rational to exploit and oppress and continue to pull fossil fuels out of the ground, even though, like, it's causing floods, it's causing wildflowers, it's causing the death and destruction of all the species. But that's rational and that's fine. (laughs) But it's just mind-boggling. It is. It is. And I I feel like that, that space creates this really powerful tension, and I think that's why a lot of people are being, like, almost, like, either called or, like, thrown into the non-linear, irrational, magical, creative practices that are really engaging other systems that are ancestral, that go beyond the system, because we are, I think, in many ways, waking up to how irrational the system is in its own empirical, rational, Western you know, context. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And yet, it is really challenging, for instance, like a lot of the time on the show, I like to talk about like how people support themselves, how they make a living, because that's one of the ways that capitalist system gets us to capitulate, right? Like, we don't have time to focus on spirit or focus on art, because we've got to hustle to make sure we can, like, pay our rent and pay back our student loans and get in for full time and pay for our health insurance, otherwise, like, we're going to be sick and... Right broke when we're 60 or whatever. So, you know, how are you navigating that? And it's, it's very difficult to navigate that too when you're trying to maintain integrity in your spiritual practice. And so I always am really curious how people negotiate that. Right. Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely an ongoing conversation I have with myself. Um, I think for the most part of my life, when I've worked a job, I've had like four, a 40 hour a week job. And so, it was actually thanks to um, Asher Hartman. He gave, oh, that's uh, Asher Hartman. He, he gave me a really powerful reading uh, like almost two years ago where he said to me, like, don't get full-time work because you're going to get in the way of yourself. And I had really witnessed that, that I, I pulled back. I only worked two or three days a week as a therapist, mm-hmm. which was, in a sense, part of my, my main income. And then those, uh, on those other days, I've been able to really fill those in with both my creative practice and also on um, my spiritual practice. I do have like a spiritual practice known as our sacred web and I work mm-hmm. with different clients. And so 
the way that I navigate that is like my social practice is completely donation based. I always give people fun and fair, and I never turn people away regardless of their kind of um, what they're able to contribute or not. And I'm really open to working with people. Um, oh, yeah. Their income. Yeah, I know that's really hard. Like for me, I don't really do work like that because my main source of income comes through my work my working with clients, so I don't have any other source of income. And so I try and have classes that are, like, cheaper so that, you know, that, like, everybody could access them. Right. And I try and find other, like, I try and find ways that I could both support my community and also not, like, take out of my apartment. Like, it's always, like, a balance. It's a conversation. And I don't know it's like, we're all having to navigate. How do we exist within this space that's very violent? Yeah. And also... Incessant, and even just earlier when you were talking about it, I heard your voice got super fast. And like, and I didn't think about that energy. I used to like work with that energy so much because I, I myself, on a day I would have off, I would have that intense feeling of like, you need to make money, you need to make money, you figure out a way to make yeah. money. And I really had to work on like letting that go. Right, so yeah, I can, yeah, ground into something else. And, and I've witnessed that I've been taken care of. And mm. Something that's been really helpful is kind of it allows me to trust that I don't need to buy into or get sucked into that energy, that really dark energy that the really dark. capitalist system pushes on to people, and so many people get stuck in that. Place. It makes you think like you're not going to be okay, and yet it's so true that when you do trust, often some support comes in right. to you know to help you to to raise you up, and so much of that comes through community, and it is so important then to cultivate that to remember that we can trust each other and you do a lot to cultivate and you know create your communities right um so tell me a little bit about your daily social practice how do you i'm really interested in the sort of syncretic forms that magic and spiritual practices such as ours are taking here in los angeles Mm -hmm. because for instance, you're pulling from your yeah, indigenous heritage, but then also from the influence of like magical practitioners and artists here in the city, and probably to a certain degree from popular culture. I'm speaking for myself as well, and like from literature and books. And you know, how do you? What do you think of this idea of syncretic magical practices versus? The question of you know authenticity and mm-hmm. well, some people might argue that we should just practice one specific. Like if you're with Eureka, you should practice that and nothing right. else. Or you know if you're doing ceremonial magic from the Western tradition, that you need to just focus on that. But a lot of us don't do that. What's your what's your policy? <laughs> yeah, so uh, that's a very good question. Um, and that's tied in a lot with my project because I've actually um, been asked that about my project already a couple of times of uh, is what you're doing authentic, right? Right. And I really acknowledge that I'm not Widarika in the sense that I was not raised as a Widarika. I ha- they're in my blood. They are my ancestors. I connect with them. And I'm also I, I think a lot about how. You know, a lot of my background in magic comes from, like, queer, trans, feminist spaces. Mm-hmm. I really, and, and also, like, radical underground, like, kind of punk spaces. Or, and that's where I really kind of, I feel like, grew up as, like, a baby whip, you know, and, like, kind of came into it. And so because of that, I acknowledge that I'm, like, a queer mutant who's hybridizing and integrating a lot of what I'm connecting with. And and I really believe that spirit is alive in the moment, and spirit and spiritual practices only make sense in the moment. And so that really has helped me be open to what spirit wants to bring in. And I feel like a lot of the work that I do is collaborative, and I really engage on people's own intuitive awakening and playfulness because I, that's where spirit moves through people. And I definitely love ritual and, and ritualistic practices that can ground work. And at the same time, I always love opening up that space because that's to me what's alive. Yeah, I mean, in my tradition, the idea is that spirit comes to you, that she's 
eminent, you know, that you can always tap into her and that she changes form constantly throughout space and time. So wherever you are, whatever time you're living and existing in, she's coming through in that place, but also touching on historical practices that some of the practices that we do now might be done, you know, might have been done like thousands of years ago in a different place under the under the I guess of a, a completely different religion or spiritual practice, right. but we just sort of intuitively can sense it and feel it yes. if we if we tune in, and that there doesn't need to necessarily be. But we don't necessarily need to pass the torch in the same way as far as you know, like um, the Catholic Church might ordain a priest or something like that. But a lot of our spiritual practices have been taken from us. But yes. like there couldn't be a limit many of that was maintained. So there's that, but then there's also this aspect of the anarchistic aspect of what we're doing, you know, no master, that we, that, that we don't need anybody's permission to do the work that we're doing, right. you know. And also, I'm really interested to know, like, it sounds like you're still in the process of investigating, investigating the like, uh, do you feel like, how do you feel like they might relate to the more queer feminist practices that you're doing, right? Because a lot of, we have a tendency to romanticize indigenous cultures and kind of say like, oh, they have the answer and they're, right. you know, that they're somehow doing better. But a lot of indigenous cultures also have really imbalanced gender divisions, right. of caste systems with their men. You know, so just, just because you're indigenous doesn't make you Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so, um, but how much do you know about what their actual system of values is? Yeah, so there's, I think I, there's probably, there's a fluidity here um, where, on the one hand, I've heard from different um, Lurarika elders I've spoken to that there, there's a belief that, as you're naming, that the divine can be connected with multiple channels and that, so and, that, and that, you know, things can stand in for things so that you could have really regimented um, ways of working and at the same time you could also, like, shift them around right. and that that's just as valuable as, as actually doing it quote-unquote right. Right. And so that to me has been very freeing because I feel like I really work in that way mm. where I love to have like something to ground myself in and I also love to play with it and as you mean, work with that anarchistic kind of chaotic energy that I really thrive in also. Um, and at the same time too, the Wiedeka as a community have very strict gender roles mm. and that's something that to me has been very interesting too because I identify as non-binary and so mm. I, in looking at Wiedeka, like clothing and such a shamanic clothing, I haven't seen myself in it because they're very kind of based on gender roles. And so there is no non binary. Well, but women are allowed to be yes. shamans in their culture? Yes, they are. And, um, and in a way, there is no division in the sense of seeing a male or a female as higher right. in their religious system. Mm -hmm. that, that doesn't exist, but there is, like, in terms of clothing, mm. that gender division. And mm -hmm. I haven't seen there be. Um, folks that are more trans, mm. um, and at the same time, I haven't heard any like transphobic or mm. homophobic um, or even misogynist mm. belief system. Mm. So that's been really helpful for me. Mm. And at the same time, like I feel with the project Give Us Home Spider, I've been really just trying to envision what I would look like as both a Wiradika shaman and also as this like hybridized mutant that mm. I envision myself as um, working within these system, navigating these systems, right? Like, um, I've been thinking a lot about what would it look like, you know, for me to meld and divide or allow these kind of gender, kind of move through me. And so I've been really working with that energy a lot in my own performance and, and in the way I've been working with clothing and props as well. Wow, okay, so really using some of the tools of theater. Yeah in order to play with these ideas. I'm so excited, and I love the idea of, of using theater and ritual and healing as this kind of cold, in this cauldron space right. way where everything gets mixed together and everything gets utilized for purpose of 
elevation or yes. expansion. Yeah. I've been to the word Newton a few times. Right. Let's unpack that. Like, I know, and I also follow you on Instagram. I have so many questions about your Instagram account. Um, so, tell it, so what's the Newton, do you have like uh, an art practice under that Newton title? Because um, you have our sacred web, and then right. the word Newton often really appears over and over again on your Instagram feed. Is there like a project that you're doing that's Newton oriented? Not really. No, Newton is kind of something that just moves through a lot of my work. Um, as, as I was growing up, I was very obsessed with the idea of a Newton. Can we define Newton? Yeah, yeah. There's, there's many different definitions of Newton. I would see Newton as being like the coyote energy, right? Yeah. That like, structure, yeah. interlocutor, shape structure, yes. Um, also the chimera, right? Yeah. yeah. And then there's also like the X-Men, yeah. those different types of lineages of like augmented or, or shifted human yeah. cyborg. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so to me, it really allows me to inhabit another type of space that um, I feel like, it, in a sense, it feels reclaiming. It's like reclaiming this concept of, of you know, being someone that's been labeled as so or a Chicano and also someone that doesn't really identify with gender binaries or even, like, sexual binaries. And I feel like queer and non-binary have really allowed me to experience Stand what it can mean to exist, and so Newton kind of goes along with that. Newton, I want to create this other space where we're really claiming and reclaiming our power. Mm. That's a big part of it. Is mm. um, I actually I've, I've done a Newton workshop where I invited a couple of other mutants and we joined together and we like did a spell where we really worked with all our powers to augment them and to also expand them because when you get people together. You know, the collective becomes larger than the sum of its parts, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so seeing that work through the mutagenic lens, I've really witnessed how people can help each other's powers grow or access levels that maybe before they weren't able to. Like, for example, I have a, a couple of times when I'm around them, I start to have more vision, Ooh. or I realize I have, like, a power that I normally don't have. And so really that allows me to kind of normalize a lot of experiences that people have all the time, right, of, of being clairsentient or clairvoyant or empathic and how that's not, also not really talked about or normalized in our society or it's demonized even in some ways. And so that also that mutant is a reclaiming that, of really acknowledging that as a gift. Mm-hmm. And that's a gift that we have to share with one another. Yes. I love that. I love that idea of reclaiming and I also love the idea of Noticing how the power shifts in different forms of communities, right? Like that we work as a sort of ecosystem together in our magical powers, in our powers of compassion, in our powers of awareness that you know we're stronger right. together. Right. And do, okay, so this is kind of maybe a cross shift, but I also want to sort of shift into this Instagram thing because you know this is something that as is a really big part of everybody's life now, right? Right. And I really admire your Instagram page because you just seem to really do it with so much joy. <laughs> it always just looks like you're having so much fun. Mm-hmm. And for me, sometimes I feel like a little person. You know, it just sometimes feels like a lot of work. So right. what is your secret to just mm-hmm. enjoying it and putting it out there? I just watched it grow for you just so quickly. And, like, you're always putting out such inspiring things. So, you know, how do you do it? What is your secret? <laughs> um, you know, I think a part of it is that I really love Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh, so how do you just crank that out? Because you... I'm just so productive. You do so much work. You're, you're always producing new images. You're always producing new songs. You're always producing new artwork. What is your, like, how do you organize your time? Mm. Well, I feel like Goddess is always channeling through me, and it, it's so relaxing for me to be able to work with that energy. Because, mm. um, you know, like, on the days I have where I feel blessed to have time to work on stuff, but even like, like, 
it's on the day that I'm going to work, mm. in the morning before I go to work. It's a way for myself to check in mm. and to be like, okay, what is God is telling me today? Mm. And that really allows me to kind of have energy that moves through me, either mm. through images or through sound or even through like spoken stuff or written stuff. I think that that is also what gives me joy is that a lot of it is my spiritual practice in many ways. It's a way that I can connect with what's coming through. Yeah, so it sounds like you really work in a sort of channeling way, like yeah. that you're really allowing energy and ideas and messages for spirit to come through. What would you say to someone who wants to feel like that, but who, you know, when they go to produce work, for instance, on Photoshop, or if they're really wanting to try and channel spirit uh, into their art practice, but they feel blocked, like what, what advice would you give them? Well, something that's really helped me is like creating more time in your life for play yeah. and for also non-linear ways of engagement, which could be meditative practices or play, playing practices or even like automatic writing, divination work. All those practices engage other parts of your consciousness that I feel like the left brain, Western, like regimented way of thinking sometimes block out. Mm. Also for myself, like I do... I do a lot of mindfulness work, a lot of planning, a lot of connecting with myself. And also, I, I create a lot of moments in my life where I'm just allowing myself to just create for the sake of creating without really knowing what it's about. Um, and that's been really helpful. Um, to, for example, just to give an example, I, I have spent some time like working on songs, for example, that I just like, work on all these songs. They all, they're all coming through, and I have no idea what they're for. And then months later, one of them is like completely resonates with a project that I'm working on. Mm-hmm. And so to me, that's been really beautiful guidance of that playing is really serious in a way, that mm-hmm. the, that, that through play we can channel, and that those channelings can be really um, helpful and also really interconnected with what's happening beyond time and space, because they can work at different times. Yeah. I think, did you always have this? Just to be able to just sort of playfully approach your work and trust everything that was coming through and just like use it to be more process oriented or what what's in your trajectory in that regard? I really had to work at that. Um, I feel like you know, I got my undergraduate in art practice and so in, and when you go to art school you don't really get taught that. No. Um, but I was you know, goddess was able to bring people into my life that really helped me with that process. Like, Asher Hartman mm. was one of my teachers, and he was one of the first teachers that really opened my eyes to just how varied and also process-based creative practices could be. And in many ways, um, the Not Enough Festival that I did in Portland, one of the main tenants we had for the festival, and I did this a lot for myself, was, was, was to experiment and to fail and yeah. to try things out. Yeah, it um, is. The more I did that, the more I realized that magic can occur with that. And so I think I also, I threw myself into it. Like, just to give you an example, I've never been a musician. Mm-hmm. And one of the years of the festival, I created three bands. So oh, that's cool. Just to do it. You know, yeah. just to say, okay, I might suck at this, mm-hmm. but I'm going to do it. And that really helps me see, like, wow, stuff can really emerge when you just let yourself experiment and maybe fail because failure is part of it and that's something that you don't get taught in art school or in academia in general. Yeah, I mean, I know that Genesis Bill of uh and their work comes out of that same space like with Psychic TV yeah. that I remember listening them at a talk at the Hammer and they said, that they decided to form a band because none of them knew how to play an <laughs> They just were like, I'm just going to do this. Um, so I actually do have a clip of some of your music, and I'd love to play a few minutes of it, and then we can talk about it afterwards. So, okay, so let's play this. I'm going to play a piece called Holy Goddess, Dios de Santa. I'm sorry? I'm going to play a piece called Dios de Santa or Holy Goddess. Yes. Yeah, okay, so let's have a listen. Thank <laughs> you. 
can you tell us a little bit about that piece? How did that come together? You're not a musician, and yet, <laughs> somehow you managed to make this. Yeah, so I, as I said, I think a lot of my, a, a lot of what I do is channeling, and so um, when I was living in the day, and I, I don't know what to, you know, I was, I, I was talking about, I was very, I was working for a as a social worker, didn't feel like I had any space in my life to do creative practice, but this was the one thing that I started to do was to work with garage bands and to just start creating music, and so I actually created this when I was in the Bay, and and that was really a way for me to engage with creative practice that felt very easy and accessible. Because I could do it in bed, I could do it in my room. And even though I'm not a musician, I feel like what I do is I sit down and I just like allow sounds to kind of percolate. And then I find ways to create those sounds. A lot of the words that I use are just channelings that come through as well. And so um, this, this last song is um, like a veneration song or a, a praise song. Um, yeah. And, and so in a way, like, I, I have a hard time still seeing myself as a musician, even though I've, like, made a lot of music. Because um, I, I don't know if I, I guess in a sense, like, I'm, someone explained it to me once the other day. It was like, I don't know kind of musician that's about a feeling, not about technicality. Right. Which I really appreciate that, you know, knowing that there's different ways to engage with musical practice, you know? That's so fascinating. I mean, this is something that I think about all the time, too. You know, and I feel like it's a real bar for people getting, producing work, and also one of the, the sort of pressures that one has across the world is to, to work with you, both as an artist and as a channeler. This idea of, like, I'm not doing it right. Mm. If this isn't the, the technique that you're supposed to use. Um... On the other hand, I also feel as an artist that, and as a magician and a witch, you know, that the more technique we have, the more able we are to articulate what we want to say, you know? So it's kind of a mutant a mutant process. I mean, how, do you feel like you try and develop your technique as a musician, or are you actively trying to not think about that? I definitely have been trying to develop my technique. Um, I've been working with different apps now, and I also have a synthesizer now, so I've slowly been evolving. Um, and at the same time, I, um, one of the projects I've worked on here in Los Angeles is a band called Yes Goddess. Oh, yeah, I love that band. I love it so much. And that band has been very much a process of unlearning and really allowing ourselves to just channel and really not seeing instruments as technical pieces and just allowing ourselves to be moved to something and to also work collaboratively mm. and connect with one another. And that, and that and in a sense, we're also working with a lot of ancient and also new, like we use synthesizers and we'll use, you know, um, devotional, like, musical instruments. And so, it, in a way, it's engaging with both the historical and also the new. And... and and at the same time, we've also been incorporating new ways of working, too. So I think there is a balance. And I'm definitely exploring both. Even though I, I do resist <laughs> the kind of more formalized technical ways of working, mm-hmm. because I do, um, I feel like it can sometimes get in the way of that channeling that can ca- come. Yeah, I mean, that's something that Ashley talks about a lot uh, in his practice and his workshop. To be able to channel is best first sensor, best sensor, just go with whatever's coming with you, right. like there is no wrong, like just let yourself open, right. instead of constantly censoring, standing over your shoulder and being like, oh, no, it's not quite right, you know, that, that if you want to be able to channel, if you want to be able to keep an open channel, that you really have to do that. Right. So I know that you mentioned that, um, oh, and then you have another band, Gay Yeah. Tell us about that. Yeah, so um, Gay um started as a side project with my partner and I, because my, my partner was named Thaddeus, and Thaddeus has uh, had a bunch of different bands, but recently has not been really making much music. I think he and I started to kind of just play around with different apps, combining different sounds that we both like. Um, and we were invited by our friend Chelsea, who lives in the Bay, to um, this event called the Universe is Late that was like a people of color punk festival that they had up there. And she essentially told us, like, make a set list and we'll, like, invite you to play. And so I really got the list and I had to, like, get something together. And it's been really wonderful. And, and a lot of the work that we 
have been doing with that is also allowing ourselves to experiment and play together as, as, a, as a couple and also as both creative beings that we are. And we've definitely engaged a lot with mutant energy, with queer energy, and we're seeing it almost as a, as a capitalizing force. And we're wanting, uh, one of our goals is to kind of spread around and connect with different queer mutants. And really just capitalize and also a big message is like you are powerful and you have so much power within. Is that something as a mutant that I want other mutants to know? Yeah, that's so important. The idea of reminding people of their own power and not to trust their own instincts and their own intuition because that's where so many of the problems that we see throughout the world happen is when we always are looking to some outside authority to give us permission or to tell us that we're doing it right. And often those authorities just don't have our best interests in, at heart. Right. You know, we have to be our own authorities and work in concert with each other. Right. So, um, tell me what your next projects are. Like, what are you working on? I know you've got so many thoughts on the board right now. What are some of the things you're, right. you're developing? Yeah, so um, this, this project, Give Us Spider, is going to be opening... Um, in September, and we're going to be having a day, um, a weekend, a two-day kind of event on the September 23rd and 24th, where people are going to be able to go to Angel's Gate and see Coastal Border, and then they'll be able to also go um, be taken around on a shuttle to all the different South Bay um, Pacific Center Time exhibits. So that's something really exciting. And in December, on um, December 10th, I'm going to be doing a screening of a documentary um, about Give Us Home Spiders, so showing all the rituals. And in October, I'm going to be doing doing the fifth ritual in my hometown of Bloomington mm. next to a quarry that was releasing toxic chemicals as I was growing up. Mm. I just also found out about, during the same time I found out about my indigenous heritage. So it's how you became an Exxon. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, and so we're going to be going um, in October to be doing, um, it's like an epilogue with, of these four rituals that I'm doing um, before I install them into Pacific Standard Time. And so how can people find out more about that? Like, if they want to come or participate, like, how, how can they find out where to do that? Yeah, people can contact me. I have, as you said, an Instagram. It's at Edgar Fabian Frias, all together, or R underscore sacred underscore web. That's my second Instagram. That's more for my practice. So people can definitely direct message me. I'm also on Facebook. Um, and I have a website, edgarfabianfrias.org where I do have a mailing list and if people um, have a mailing list and stuff if people want to talk to me. Uh, it's great. I love to hear all your news and everything. Yeah. So we have about five minutes left and uh, I'd like to know about, you know, a lot of the work that you're doing now is very ritual based and, y- you know, Every tradition has their own idea of what a ritual is and how it does. What are some of the things that you like to include in the rituals? Like, how do you begin a ritual? How do you end a ritual? What's the process? What makes something a ritual rather than just something you're doing? How, how do you know what a ritual is? Right. Um, it's all about intention. And so I, I definitely like to have an opening and an ending. And... It always varies. Um, I do, depending, like, it, the one that I've been doing recently, I, I work a lot with land energy, so I've been doing calling the directions a lot, and, and I also don't do that. Um, so it really just depends on the intention behind it. And one thing that I love working with in ritual is really knowing that we're entering into a field of energy together. And so that, in and of itself, kind of allows people to tap into something else. And so I, I really love seeing people, especially people who say, I've never done this tool, I don't even know what it's about. Just once you name it and set that intention and you open the space in whatever way you want to open it, there's something that always happens very magically that people just fall into line in their own world and something just moves to them. And people witness that and I've witnessed that so much. And so... It's something that I love working with, just kind of knowing that there's, I'm working with something beyond myself. Mm. That there's a history here, there's a field here of energy. Mm. And so I just love facilitating that process. Mm. Yeah, I'm really interested in that right now, too, this idea of through your intention, through your statement, saying, okay, now we're slowing down. Now we're entering into a different state of consciousness. 
now we're looking at this object not just as an object, but as a tool, as a guide, as a teacher, as a spirit. And just in that statement of intent, how it transforms everything that we do. I know that you also are using, because you have this, musical gifts are... You know, many, many shamanic cultures, for instance, use sound, so it's what's called a sonic driving to shift you into a state of trance. When, so when you're out there doing these rituals, often in places that are kind of torn up, right. toxified, you know, remote regions, or regions that are very much within that capitalist matrix that we were talking about before, you're sort of entering the matrix with your work, right? Right. Um, right. And getting the line in and going in there to do these sort of destabilizing rituals. Right. And even the, the last ritual I'm going to be doing in October, a, a big element that we're going to connect with is sound voice, mm-hmm. especially because the chemicals that were being released uh, directly affect the respiratory system. Oh, right. And so wanting to work with the voice, and as a way as you're meaning to engage with the rest of the spirits that are there that have been ignored, the land spirits, the ancestors that were dislocated, and allow them to move through us. Mm-hmm. And so I've been, I've been inviting a couple of really powerful practitioners here in Los Angeles to come to the Inland Empire to do that work. Fantastic. What would you say to, we're just closing out now, but so what would you say to someone who is really just starting off in the process of spiritual discovery and starting to see how art and spirit interact and you know, want to connect to our ancestors. Like, if you could go back and speak to yourself when you were beginning this journey, mm-hmm. you know, what would you tell yourself? Hmm. I would tell myself to trust that there is a process happening. Because I really believe that goddess, that this web of energy is moving and guiding people. And so, even if your life looks like it's chaotic or like it has no path, there's some wisdom here. And to really move into that wisdom. And to know that your life is going to take a lot of different roads and to be okay with that. Yeah. And to trust that out of all this traveling and movement, that something will start to emerge. Yeah. To pay attention to, to listen. Yes. Yeah. To listen to the crystals and to trust what you hear and right. the messages you receive from them. Yes. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much for coming in. It has been so much fun to talk to you. I can't wait to get you in again. (laughs) Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I've been on such a fan of you (laughs) and your work. So it's such an honor. Yeah, victory to the goddess. Yeah. All right, next time, folks. Thank you, Los Angeles. We'll see you soon.